Good morning. I'm here this morning with uh, Gary Yeo, the Huffington Professor of Economics and Environmental Studies here at Wesleyan University. And we're going to talk about uh, climate change and sustainability. And uh, Gary, I'm delighted you're able to join me this morning. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's the pleasure's mine. We, uh, well, let's get right into it. The, uh, the framework for this course, which we've talked a little bit about uh, off camera, is uh, to, to have our students who are scattered around the world, uh, two thirds of the students in this class will be outside the United States. And um, we're, we're trying to hit three notes. Uh, what do we know? Why should we care? And what can we do? And uh, so let's start off to talk a little bit about what do we know now about climate change? We know a lot about the science, not everything, but mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, we know that the planet has warmed about a degree centigrade since pre-industrial levels. Um, we know that from thermometers and other points of data. Uh, and we know that it's very unlikely that the current climate and the past climate were generated by the same climate system. So the old mm -hmm. normal is broken. We have no idea what the new normal is, mm -hmm. but it's unequivocal that the planet has warmed. Is, that, is this something uh, that one expects to happen every s several centuries or something? In other words, are these, I mean, the, cl the planet has gone through different cycles of climate change and, and is, What's different about this one? Um, what's different about this one are two things. One, it's happened much more quickly than mm. it's ever happened before. And secondly, there are um, bits of evidence from a variety of model exercises that say that a good deal of the driver of the warming has been human influence, the emissions yeah. of greenhouse gases. And that's our focus in this class, is really how, um, how we have changed the world uh, uh, inadvertently or without realizing what changes we were creating and how we can be more intentional about the changes we want to see occur in the world. Uh, so uh, the, the planet has warmed already and, and w w what's the trajectory that the scientists see uh, coming? Well, th there, there are a couple of points there. One is that the warming that we've seen is only half of the warming to which we have committed ourselves. Uh, so that the one degree that we've already seen has another one degree built into the system that there's nothing we can do about. I see, because it's already in process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's an enormous amount of inertia in the climate system. The mm -hmm. heat gets built in. Right. The response uh, in ambient air temperature or ocean temperatures and things like that have significant lags. But right. we are committed to that. If we, if we eliminated greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, we would still be committed to another degree of warming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we eliminated greenhouse gases tomorrow and we had that degree of warming, would we then see a cooling? No. I see. So it's, it, that, be, that becomes the new normal. That, that, well, that begins to define the new normal. Um, part of the new science, I'm told, is that the long-run equilibrium temperature of the planet is determined by a couple of decades of the maximum concentration of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So among the implications to that is we're already about 450 parts per million in CO2 equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, we have committed to a certain amount of temperature increase associated with that. Um, from an economist's perspective, going back to 350, apologies to Bill McGibbon, wouldn't buy us a thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rate at which the long run temperature, once it's achieved, uh, depreciates over time is in orders of centuries or millennia. I see. And how did you, as an economist, uh, get into this field? I mean, uh, this is a field for climate scientists and biologists and uh, you know, people doing evolutionary science. Tell me a little bit about how an economist enters this domain. Um, well, my personal story started in about 1981. Um, one of my thesis advisors, Bill Nordhaus at Yale, invited me to become part of a National Academy of Sciences study called Changing Climate. Um, seemed like a good idea at the time, so I said yes. Um, and we produced a report in 1982. Um, our contribution was thinking in the aggregate about the economic activity that drives the emissions of greenhouse gases mm -hmm. uh, along a variety of, of futures, 
which we can't predict which one, but mm -hmm. what was the range. And we produced what were affectionately called spaghetti graphs, just mm -hmm. a whole series of possible trajectories of what the emissions would be. And back then we had a very simple model that could translate that into concentrations and translate that into temperatures, but that was about as far as it went. Um, after that, I began to worry about um, some other environmental uh, problems applying the same methodology like CFCs and ozone depletion and things like that. What's, what's, what's CFCs? Chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and then began to worry about impacts and how to calibrate those. Mm -hmm. And then began to worry about adaptation, how you could ameliorate the impacts by responding to certain things and what were the underlying determinants of the capacity to adapt. And, <clears throat> and the, what we've learned since those early days is about the trajectory of warming mm -hmm. um, and uh, what other major advances in what we know about climate change have you seen uh, since those early days of the spaghetti graphs? Um, we don't know a lot more about how to project what the future is going to be, so we're still dealing with um, the full range of possibilities. We've learned a lot more about how various strata in societies and various countries around the world might be able to respond, mm -hmm. um, both with respect to reducing emissions and also with respect to um, adaptation and reducing vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, the, major dis the major conclusion of the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, was that this is a risk problem, it's right. not a cost-benefit problem. And so risk is likelihood times consequence, and it depends on co-benefits, damages, attitudes towards equity, right. things like that. Um, but what that conclusion meant, and it was unanimously agreed to word for word by 196 countries in a plenary meeting at the synthesis report for the fourth assessment report, is that our clients in the IPCC wanted to know about risk, they wanted to know about likelihood and consequence, and we no longer had to focus our attention on what we knew a lot about. Mm -hmm. We could talk about conclusions that for which we had lower confidence if we could tell a story that the con or lower confidence, but tell a story that the consequences could be really quite severe. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of being fear-mongering, um, we were now addressing the needs of the of the clients that we had. The National Climate Assessment has adopted risk management. The America's Climate Choices Academy reports adopted that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the other key word is iterative. We finally figured out that nobody's going to write climate policy for 100 years. Yeah. And so you have to figure out what to monitor, how quickly to make the adjustments, and um, what those adjustments would depend on. So I, I want to come back to this. Um to this change uh, to, to uh, a, a, a paradigm concerned with risk, so to make sure everybody understands that, that transition. But before we go there, I, I, I know you, you've dealt with the, these kinds of folks over the years. What do you say to people who say, um, you know, this, it, it's really cold in, in where I'm living, or, you know, the, it's, you know that, uh, how can you say that climate change brings flooding and drought? I mean, mm -hmm. people who use their own local uh, perception uh, as a point of resistance to, the, to this kind of more global uh, uh, sense of, of change. Um, that is sometimes a difficult conversation, but there's two ways of going about it. Um, one is for people who are skeptical of the whole idea. Mm -hmm. How do you know humans are causing it? Right. Um, and that is, in fact, model-based. Right. Um, we don't have a parallel planet where we, where we can do the controlled experiment. Right. Uh, so we have what we have. Um, and very high confidence that humans at this point um, are, are causing a good deal of the warming that we've, that we've observed. Are we absolutely sure? No, right. um, but we're 95% sure. Yeah. And so you get in these conversations with guys like Fred Singer, who was a, who was a, a global skeptic, um, and said, you know, Fred, how sure are you that you are right? Yeah. And at one point in, in a conversation <laughs> in my office, he said, well, I'm 95% sure. And then you say, well, for risk-based framing, all I need is that 5%. Right. 
And he said, you know, and then I asked him why he was so afraid of, of some interventions that would reduce the, the, um, the pace of emissions of greenhouse gases. And he said, because they're going to be so expensive. And how do you know that? From economic models. And then you get to look at him and say, you believe economic models right. more <laughs> than you believe climate models? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so that, that's, that's um, one, one way of, of um, approaching that, that problem. Uh, an, another way is to simply say that once you accept it as a risk problem, businesses, human beings, communities, families, deal with risks all the time. They buy right. insurance, they do right. this, they do that. Sometimes they're required to do it, sometimes they do it because uh, they think it's a good idea. Um, all we're saying now is that climate is another source of risk, another source of uncertainty in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you are seeing is a pattern of a change in the frequency and intensity of extreme events right. of all sorts. Yeah. So you get higher precipitation in short periods of time, Right, uh, in, in, interrupted by long periods with almost no precipitation at all. So you can get flooding mm -hmm. and then and droughts, drought. yeah. um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, in, in thinking about the, the the transition to risk, I just want to make or the model modeling of risk. Um, uh, I, I want to make sure that. I understand, and our students understand the, the that change because uh, it seems really fundamental that at some point there was this, you know, the fear mongering was was uh, well, it was based in, in in the science, right? I mean, it, it was re it's really scary, um, but it, it it's I guess that you, you said it's certainly going to be bad, and 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 people would say, well, aha, this wasn't as bad as you said it was, and so then you threw out the whole science. And now we're moving to a different model, which which is is it more would it be fair to say it's more probability based? Is that the is that how we should think about it? Absolutely, um, it is probability based, but it can be subjective and it doesn't have to be quantitative. Hmm. Um, the risk based approach is a way of organizing your thoughts. It tells you to think about consequences and think about likelihood. Mm -hmm. And so, in the New York panel on climate change for for um, Mayor Bloomberg, right, um, there was an acceptance of the risk based framing. Uh, pushback that we don't have all these probabilities, we can't mm -hmm. calibrate the, the consequences or stuff. So we created this thought organizing matrix that had level of consequence on one axis and likelihood on another. Right. And um, there were a variety of people in an adaptation task force for the mayor from private sector and from various agencies. He had been mayor for a long time, right. so everybody played nice <laughs> in, the, in the sandbox. Um, and they were asked to look at the infrastructure over which they had control mm -hmm. and authority and think about projections, a wide range of projections of how the climate might change and think about what the vulnerabilities would be to those, their infrastructure right. over time with those, those particular scenarios. Not quantify them, just put them in right. dots right. In, in, this, in this matrix. The th and that was very subjective. They all went back to their offices and did it. So the thing that made it work was they all came back and presented it to the, each other. I see. And so they came up with um, a relative consistent view of the subjective judgment of what's very likely and what's unlikely, mm -hmm. what's high consequence, what's low consequence. Right. And then they had to go back and think about how they would respond and win um, and came up with 450 different adaptation ideas really? and across the private and public sectors in New York City, um, costing tens of billions of dollars if and they wanted are to do that. Adaptation ideas, do they, does that mean they're not about uh, carbon emissions, but they're about how to deal with the effect of the changing? Exactly. Um, Can you give us some examples? Um, well, uh, flooding the subways. Right. Uh, one of the things that, the, that they observed was that back in the 90s, the subday, subways might flood once every three or four years. Um, in the late 90s, it was sort of once a year. 
um, in the early part of this century, it was more like four or five times a year, and the floods were getting worse. Right. This was not from coastal storms or anything. Uh -huh. This was from extreme precipitation events, and there's not a lot in New York City that absorbs water. Right, right? It just runs down into the drains and yeah. anything, anything that's open. Um, so they began to think about how to protect the subways and how to protect the infrastructure underground. Verizon did exactly the same thing because all of their, yeah. their, their cables were underground um, and they had to worry about those sorts of things. Um, there was, uh, I'm told, a story where the, the person who was designing the New World Trade Center came to the scientists on the panel and said, I could rotate this thing 15 degrees if you could tell me how the prevailing wind in a big storm was going to change direction. Huh. We had no idea. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> wow. so, so he put it up uh -huh. the, way, yeah. the way he wanted to do it. Um, then we started to think about extreme events, and one of the things that I think we can claim is that we saved lives in anticipation of Hurricane Sandy, because mm -hmm. the mayor shut down the subways right. 10 hours before Sandy made landfall. Uh, and the MTA moved all of the trains to higher ground, right. so they weren't in the tunnels. Um, the estimate is when the tunnels flooded, uh, there would have been 10 trains uh, with 10 cars each, 100 people in each car, in the subways. And that's 10,000 people that were, would have been in really extreme risk. Yeah, that's a great example. And, and so the why we should care question becomes why we should care about this instead of like why should we care in general it's mm -hmm. like, like why do you care about flooding uh, why do you care about um the tornadoes and that will depend where you live what the nature of i guess like any other kind of insurance question uh what what is what is my situation and how do i want to protect myself against really extreme danger even if it's not that likely well, this is, I mean, one of the new things recently is this concern about adaptation and, and the acceptance of that as something to think about. For a very long time, the environmental community wanted to resist talking about adaptation because yeah. it sounded like you were giving up on the problem. Yes. And, and, and since it's already starting to happen, we're seeing changes in, in the frequency of droughts and mm -hmm. floods and wildfires from pine bark right. beetles. Um, uh, heavy precipitation in local areas causing flash flooding. Um, sea level rise makes the manifestation of any coastal storm more severe when it makes landfall, not just hurricanes. Right. Uh, those sorts of things are starting to become recognized by people. So they get to think about what it means in their lives. Um, Extreme, by, by the way, it, it, extreme precipitation when it happens in the summer is a huge downpour. I have a little rain gauge on my deck of, over in Portland, and two years ago in the summer, we got four and a half inches of rain in 35 minutes. Um, but when it happens in the winter, it's snowstorm. Right. And so Senator Inhofe will go out and build an igloo and said, this is Al Gore's house, and right. how could right. we have global warming because we have all this snow? Well. Um, a hallmark of climate change is a change in the intensity of these precipitation events, and if it happens in the winter, it's white. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so this in the question of risk and uh, vulnerability it reminds me of you know when my years in California, when when people really tried to understand how much you should protect against. Uh, an, an extreme earthquake, or earthquakes of various kinds, right? Which you don't know when they're going to happen, but it's likely over a certain range of time um, you're going to have some of these events. And and how do you protect yourself against the worst ones, or um, or how do you choose how to protect yourself? Now, the difference, I guess, with climate change is that we're we don't know that we're doing anything to cause and increase likelihood of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're only focused on mitigation there um, or adaptation mm -hmm. to living in a seismically active zone. Uh, uh, and, and people, of course, spend billions of dollars to uh, protect against these events and, and, and with already some success. Uh, but they are not trying to reduce seismic activity. Right. Do you worry about um, the, uh, the like taking one's eye off the uh, the goal of, of of reducing emissions because we're we focus very much on ad adaptation. Um, 
No, I don't. Actually, I've, I've, um, notwithstanding lack of action at the federal level in the United States, there are regional carbon emissions programs, REGI in New mm-hmm. England, California has its own cap and trade, there's right. some in the Midwest. Um, people are beginning to worry about that, yeah. right? but that's, that, that's more um, a government problem and a policy problem, and it involves pricing carbon and investing in mm-hmm. alternative energies and things like that. So there's a real role for the public sector in that. The adaptation stuff is one necessary because we're already seeing yeah. this stuff, and two, it can go down to the local level. Um, when we had a couple of years ago, we had remember we had those big snowstorms yes. one after another. Oh, yes. I ended up with four feet of snow on my mm-hmm. roof, and had four or five guys up on my roof shoveling it off. Right. Um, the roof was about twenty years old. They had steel shovels and they did some damage, so it was time to change right. the roof. Um, But I remembered the extreme precipitation event. So when we changed the roof, um, put on new gutters, and I put commercial size gutters on instead of residential size gutters to handle the excess water that happens every every once in a while. Because with the regular size gutters, it was just overflowing, going down next to the foundation and ended up in the basement. That wasn't so good. Um, So this works better. It gets the water in the backyard. So these kinds of uh, adaptations can take place at every level, from the personal to the to the to the governmental.